குட் ஈவினிங் எஸ் ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு டெய்லி நியூஸ் அனாலிசிஸ் பிராட் யூ பை சங்கர் ஐஏஎஸ் அகாடமி டுடேஸ் டேட் இஸ் சிக்ஸ்டீன்த் டிசம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ டிஸ்பிளேட் ஹியர் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் டாபிக்ஸ் யூ கோயிங் டு சி டுடே நான் விதவுட் வேஸ்டிங் எனி டைம் லெட் அஸ் கேட் இன் டு த டிஸ்கஷன் லுக் அட் திஸ் நியூஸ் ஆர்டிக்கல் இட் ரிப்போர்ட்ஸ் தட் இந்தியன் ரயில்வேஸ் இஸ் பிளானிங் டு ரைஸ் த டிரான்ஸ்போர்ட் ஆஃப் கோல் த்ரூ ரயில் பை அட்லீஸ்ட் ஃபோர் ஹண்ட்ரட் மில்லியன் டன்ஸ் இன் நெக்ஸ்ட் எயிட் இயர்ஸ் The news article further says that railways is facing congestion and logistical challenges in achieving this goal. So this is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us learn about the types of coal and its distribution. First let us see some basics about coal. Coal is a black or brown sedimentary rock. It is composed mostly of carbon and hydrocarbon. The coal contains huge energy that can be released through combustion process. That is through burning process. Coal is mostly burned for fuel and also used to generate electricity. Currently, coal is the largest source of energy for generating electricity in the world. Here note that coal is classified as a fossil fuel and fossil fuels are formed from remains of ancient organisms. Under high pressure and high temperature, the organic matter in the dead organisms get slowly converted into the coal. So this is how coal was formed. Now with this basics, let us see the types of coal and its distribution. Here note that coal is classified based on the amount of carbon content present in it. There are four major types of coal, anthracite, bituminous, lignite and peat. Now let us see them one by one. First one is anthracite coal. It is the best quality coal with the carbon content up to 80 to 95 percentage. They are also called as carboniferous coal. In India, we have only very limited anthracite coal deposits and it is mostly found in Jammu and Kashmir region. Secondly, bituminous coal. The carbon content in bituminous coal varies from 40 to 80 percent. It is also called Gondwana coal. Note that about 80 percentage of coal deposits in India is bituminous type. States such as Jharkhand, West Bengal, Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh have deposits of bituminous. Thirdly, let us take the lignite. Lignite is a brown rock also called as brown coal. Lignite coal is a low grade coal and its carbon content is about 25 to 35 percentage. It retains more moisture than other types of coal and this makes it expensive and dangerous to mine, store and transport. In India, the tertiary lignite coal is mainly found in Assam, Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Nagaland, Tamil Nadu, Pondicherry and Gujarat. The last one is peat coal. It is the lowest grade coal. It has lot of moisture and impurities. So when we burn peat, it leaves a lot of ash behind. In India, peat is found in Nilgiri Hills, Jhelum Valley in Jammu and Kashmir. So this is all about the types of coal and its distribution. With this, let us conclude this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this editorial article. This article is speaking about India woman relationship. Today the Sultan of Oman is visiting India on a state visit. This is his first visit to India after becoming Sultan of Oman in January 2020. Earlier in February 2018 our Prime Minister Modi has visited Oman during such visits many key agreements on trade defense and security were agreed between India and Oman this made a milestone in diplomatic relations between the two countries as i said that the sultan of oman is visiting india today so we can expect some key developments and agreements between india and oman this article here discusses the areas of cooperation between india and oman so in this discussion we shall see this relationship in detail the formal diplomatic relations between india and oman were established in 1955 the relationship was upgraded to a strategic partnership in 2008 here note that oman is an absolute monarchical country led by a sultan this means that oman is ruled by hereditary monarchs called sultans now let us see in brief about the location of oman oman is located on the southeastern edge of arabian peninsula it shares land borders with saudi arabia united arab emirates and yemen and it shares maritime borders with iran and pakistan oman is open to arabian sea and gulf of oman Now coming back to India Oman relations Oman is the closest partner to India around 7 lakh indian people are residing at oman so at the people to people level indian women enjoy close ties here note that oman is an integral part of all important groupings in arab region it forms part of Gulf Cooperation Council Organization of Islamic Cooperation and Arab League so the ability of women to manage power games in arab region makes it vitally important to india now let us see the economic and trade relations between india and oman in last year the bilateral trade between two countries reached around 12 billion us dollars 
இந்தியாஸ் மேஜர் எக்ஸ்போர்ட்ஸ் டு ஓமன் இன்க்ளூட் டெக்ஸ்டைல்ஸ் கெமிக்கல்ஸ் அயன் அண்ட் ஸ்டீல் டீ காஃபி ஸ்பைசஸ் ரைஸ் அண்ட் மீட் ப்ராடக்ட்ஸ் இந்தியாஸ் மேஜர் இம்போர்ட்ஸ் ஃப்ரம் ஓமன் இன்க்ளூட் யூரியா எல்என்ஜி பாலிப்ரொப்பிலின் லூப்ரிகேட்டிங் ஆயில் டேட்ஸ் குரோமைட் ஓர் எக்ஸெட்ரா ஹியர் நோட் தட் இன் டூ தௌசண்ட் டுவெண்ட்டி டூ இந்தியா வாஸ் த செகண்ட் லார்ஜஸ்ட் மார்க்கெட் ஃபார் ஓமன்ஸ் க்ரூட் ஆயில் எக்ஸ்போர்ட்ஸ் ஆஃப்டர் சைனா அப்பார்ட் ஃப்ரம் ட்ரேட் தெர் ஆர் ஓவர் சிக்ஸ் தௌசண்ட் இந்தியா ஓமன் ஜாயிண்ட் வெஞ்சர்ஸ் இன் ஓமன் ஆல்சோ நோட் தட் இன் அக்டோபர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி டூ இந்தியன் ஓமன் லான்ச் ரூபே டெபிட் கார்டு இன் ஓமன் இட் வாஸ் அ மேஜர் பூஸ்ட் டு இந்தியாஸ் இனிஷியேட்டிவ் ஆஃப் ப்ரொமோட்டிங் டிஜிட்டல் பப்ளிக் இன்ஃபிராஸ்ட்ரக்சர் இன் த வேர்ல்ட் அப்பார்ட் ஃப்ரம் திஸ் தெர் இஸ் ஆல்சோ எ ப்ரப்போசல் ஃபார் லேயிங் தௌசண்ட் ஃபோர் ஹண்ட்ரட் கிலோமீட்டர் லாங் டீப் சி பைப் லைன் ஃப்ரம் ஓமன் டு இந்தியா ஃபார் த ட்ரான்ஸ்ஃபர் ஆஃப் கேஸ் ஸோ திஸ் இஸ் ஆல் அபவுட் த ட்ரேட் அண்ட் எக்கனாமிக் டைஸ் நவ் கமிங் டு த டிஃபென்ஸ் ரிலேஷன்ஸ் சி ஓமன் இஸ் த ஃபஸ்ட் கல்ஃப் கண்ட்ரி where all the three wings of india's defense forces held joint exercises let us see the names of defense exercise the joint military exercise is termed as al naja the joint air force exercise is called as eastern bridge and the joint naval exercise is termed as nasim al bar remember these names this will be very useful for all the exams apart from holding military exercise an indian naval ship has been stationed in the gulf of oman for anti piracy operations since 2012 Then in the recent years both countries have cooperated in ensuring maritime security in Indian Ocean region also note that in 2019 during Persian Gulf crisis Indian Navy launched operation Sankalp and this was to ensure the safe passage of Indian ships from the coast of Oman so this is all regarding India Oman relationship now let us move to the next topic Take a look at this editorial article the author of the article analyzes the reasons for recent Chennai floods So in the news article discussion let us understand some of the important points given in the news article using our mains answer writing approach now this is the question account for the huge flooding of million cities in india including the smart ones like hyderabad and pune suggest lasting remedial measures so this question was asked in mains examination 2020 it comes under gs paper 3 under the syllabus of disaster management firstly understand the demand of the question the keyword in the question is account for when the keyword account for is used you have to give reasons or causes of something here you have to write the causes of urban flooding in india secondly the question asks you to suggest lasting solutions or measures to address the urban flooding remember you should not give temporary solutions for urban flooding so this is how we are going to address this question in the introduction part we are going to write about what is the basics of urban flooding you can also write about the basic definition of urban flooding urban flooding is the accumulation of water in an area either by direct rainfall or through spill of huge amount of water from water bodies beyond normal limits it leads to temporary relocation of people damage to civic communities deterioration of water quality and risk of epidemics over the past several years there is increasing trend of urban flood disasters in india whereby major cities in india have been severely affected so this is how you can write the introduction part now moving on to the body of the answer here you can split the body of the answer into two parts firstly we are going to write about the reasons for urban flooding then we have to suggest some permanent solutions for this issue so first let us list out the reasons for urban flooding in india The first reason is meteorological factor. See Indian Meteorological Department's data reveal that in past century that is from 1901 to 2015 there has been a rise in widespread extreme rainfall events across Indian subcontinent. It is increased by threefold. So this results in occasional high intensity cyclones from Arabian Sea to western coast and Bay of Bengal to eastern coast. So this results in heavy rains lasting for at least 2 to 3 days which when spread over larger region cause flash floods. So this is the first reason of urban flooding. The second reason is hydrological factors. See the flood risk arises when the surface runoff is more than the infiltration rate this causes overbank flow of channel networks leading to urban floods the coastal areas of india particularly the eastern coast experience storm surges during cyclones here storm surges are nothing but abnormal rise in sea level caused by cyclonic winds this storm surges along with high tides can inundate low lying coastal areas this causes flooding in urban zones present along the coast 
The occurrence of high tides impedes the drainage in the coastal cities as well. Thirdly, you can write about anthropogenic causes. Firstly, unplanned urbanization. It is a key issue of urban flooding. Pollution of natural urban water bodies and converting them for development purpose has increased the risk of flood. Secondly, encroachments are also a major problem in many cities and towns. Increased urbanization causes significant changes to natural watershed conditions. As a result of this, the capacity of natural drains decreases, resulting in enormous flooding. Thirdly, the cities are becoming increasingly impervious to water due to increasing built-up area and the nature of materials used. The hard and non-porous construction material makes the soil impervious. So it alters the natural drainage routes and aids quick inundation of water in cities. Finally, inadequate drainage infrastructure is also a reason. See, cities like Hyderabad, Mumbai rely on a century-old drainage system covering only a small part of core city. In last 20 years, Indian cities have grown main fold with the original built-up area. But the drainage system has not been developed. So this remains as a concern and leads to urban flooding. So you can write these points in the first part of your answer. Now moving on to the second part of the answer. Here you have to suggest some of the permanent solution to the menace of urban flooding. Firstly, you have to write about the National Disaster Management Guidelines to create National Hydro Meteorological Network. This network provides early warning and should use Doppler weather radars to cover all urban areas in the country. It should act as an inventory of existing stormwater drainage system. Secondly, utilizing international best practices. For example, implementing mobile walls like in Germany and sponge cities like in China. These concepts involve replacing concrete pavements with porous pavements to ensure better filtration. Thirdly, protection of wetlands. See, urban flooding may increase if the wetlands are not protected around the cities. The Center for Science and Environment has recommended strong laws to protect urban lakes, their catchment and feeder channels. So this should be implemented strictly. Fourthly, creating water sensitive urban design. These methods take into consideration the topography, the types of surfaces, natural drainage and leave very less impact on the environment. Promoting suitable use of land is also a way out. Low lying areas in cities have to be reserved for parks and other low impact human activities. Encroachments in natural drainage should also be restricted. Clearance of river beds and proper implementation of coastal regulation zone rules should be given priority. Apart from this, planting drought resistant and flood resistant trees in vulnerable areas also helps. Finally, different government scheme can be converged. For example, Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation, National Heritage City Development and Augmentation Yojana, Smart Cities Mission, these can be converged to create a better plan for urban conservation. So you can write these points in the second part of your answer. Finally, we have come to the conclusion, overburdened drainage, unregulated construction and no regard for natural topography and these all make urban floods a man-made disaster. India has to learn its lessons from recent floods in Assam, Bihar, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Kerala. Addressing the underlying causes and taking immediate effective measures is most important to tackle and overcome the floods and its devastation. So in this way, you can conclude the answer and in this discussion we have seen what are the reasons for urban flooding and what can be done to prevent the urban flooding. So with this let us conclude this discussion and move to the next topic. Have a look at this news article. President of Venezuela and President of Guyana has decided to held talks to resolve the long-standing dispute over oil-rich region. They decided not to use military force to settle the dispute. So in this context, let us understand the dispute between Venezuela and Guyana. See, Venezuela is a country on the northern coast of South America. It is bounded by Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean on the north, Guyana to the east, Colombia to the southwest and Brazil to the south. So this is where the Guyana is and this is where Venezuela. Venezuela is a presidential republic, so the head of the government is a either directly or indirectly elected by the people and Venezuela will hold the presidential election in 2024. So the border dispute of Guyana and Venezuela is brought into limelight to distract the voters. Now talking about the border dispute, Venezuela Guyana border dispute is about the ownership of Esquibo region which is an oil rich region in between these two countries. 
Like all border disputes, this one also dates back to colonial era. In 19th century, both Venezuela and Guyana were colonies of Spain and Britain respectively. The border between two territories, that is the Venezuela controlled by Spanish and Guyana controlled by British was settled through a 1899 arbitral award and this is known as Paris Arbitration. According to the award, this Esquibo region which is an oil rich region was granted to Guyana. But Venezuela opposed this agreement. Venezuela argued that it was not part of 1899 agreement and it was illegal imposition by colonial powers. So Venezuela argued that this Esquibo region belongs to Venezuela. Over the years, the efforts have been made to find a resolution through diplomatic and international forums. United Nations also played a role in mitigating the issue between two countries to find a peaceful solution. However, dispute remains unresolved causing tensions between Venezuela and Guyana. The present the presence of these oil resources had added complexity to the dispute as both countries are seeking their rights and claims in the region. So we have to wait and see what will happen on this issue. So this is all about the discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. Yesterday, the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal refused to stay the proposed merger between Z Entertainment Enterprises and Sony. Earlier, two finance entities named Axis Finance an IDBI bank has challenged the merger in NCLAT. They said that Z Entertainment had given guarantee for loans that they had given to private entity. So the finance entity said that they would not be able to recover the loan from Z Entertainment. So they approached the NCLAT to stay the proposed merger between Z Entertainment and Sony. However, National Company Law Appellate Tribunal refused to stay the merger. So this is the crux of the news article. Now in this discussion, let us understand some points about National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. National Company Law Appellate Tribunal was constituted in 2016. It was set up under Companies Act 2013. So it is a statutory body. The NCLAT was constituted with the purpose of hearing appeals against orders of National Company Law Tribunal. This means that NCLAT functions as an appellate tribunal. Here, appellate tribunal means a special court or tribunal that is formed to reconsider a decision made by another court or tribunal. As we saw just now, NCLAT hears appeals against the order of NCLT. Now what does NCLT do? National Company Law Tribunal. It was constituted in 2016 under Companies Act 2013. The NCLT was formed to deal with corporate disputes that are of civil in nature. It also adjudicates the cases related to insolvency and liquidation of corporate companies under Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code 2016. See, if any party is aggrieved by the orders of NCLT, then they may approach the NCLAT for appeal. Now, talking about the functions of NCLAT, National Company Law Appellate Tribunal also functions as an appellate tribunal under Competition Act 2002. It hears and disposes of appeals against decisions or orders passed by Competition Commission of India. And finally, NCLAT functions as appellate tribunal to hear and dispose of appeals against the orders of National Financial Reporting Authority, NFRA. So these are all some important functions performed by NCLAT. Here note that if any person is not satisfied with the orders of NCLAT, they can appeal to the Supreme Court. The person has to approach the Supreme Court within 60 days from the date of order given by NCLAT. Now finally, let us see the composition of NCLAT. NCLAT consists of a chairperson, judicial and technical members. They are approved with a tenure of 5 years. The chairperson and judicial members are appointed after consultation with Chief Justice of India, whereas the technical members are appointed on recommendation of a selection committee. And the selection committee consists of four members. They include Chief Justice of India, Senior Judge of Supreme Court, Secretary of Ministry of Corporate Affairs, Secretary to Ministry of Law and Justice. So these four members comprise a selection committee and this selection committee appoints the technical member to NCLAT. Now talking about the qualification of the members. The chairperson shall be a former or presiding judge of Supreme Court or Chief Justice of High Court. Then the technical members must possess special knowledge in industrial finance, industrial management, industrial reconstruction, investment and accountancy. The technical member should also have a professional experience of not less than 25 years. 
So these are the qualification of the members appointed for NCLAT. So this is all we have to know about NCLAT and National Company Law Tribunal. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. It is about National Company Law Appellate Tribunal. Look at the first statement. It is a statutory body established under Companies Act 2013. Yes, this statement is correct. It hears and disposes of appeals against the order passed by Competition Commission of India. Yes, this statement is also correct. So the correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Now look at the second question. Consider the following countries, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Yemen, Bahrain. How many of the above countries share land borders with Oman? The correct answer is option B. Only three. See this map. Oman shares land borders with Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates and Yemen. And it shares maritime borders with Iran and Pakistan. So only three countries given here share land borders with Oman. Now coming to the third question. Consider the following. Carbon dioxide, oxides of nitrogen, oxides of sulfur. Which of the above are emitted from coal combustion at thermal power plants? The correct answer is option D. All the three. The combustion of coal in coal-fired thermal power plants releases harmful gases like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds. So all these are released from thermal coal power plants. Now coming to the fourth question, what is the primary cause of Venezuela guyana dispute which is recently seen in the news? So the correct answer is option C, competing territorial claims. So both Venezuela and Guyana are competing for Esquibo region which is an oil rich region. So the dispute is related to territorial claims. So the correct answer is option C. With this we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video please share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS YouTube channel. Thank you.